Einhoven, she is the smartest person I've ever met. Uh, I secretly call her Mrs. Spock, and for God's sake, don't tell her that if you see her. Um, not just because she's so smart, but she's also super logical. And in September 2015, she took over as CEO of Sanima. Sanima is a billion dollar uh, media conglomerate. Uh, we own TV stations, newspapers, magazines, and a whole plethora of sites, you know, you name it, we've got it, in Holland, Finland, and Belgium. And when she took over, it really was a sinking ship. Uh, and the first thing Susan did uh, was she cut the entire digital division, which, keeping the businesses, but cut the entire management team, because it wasn't logical that we had this structure, and it wasn't. And at the time, I was one of those managers, uh, and I had been Sanima for about nine months, so I was the head of digital strategy for this division. And before Sanima, I had my own startup for four years. I started it, ran it, uh, and after four years, it failed. And we did so many things really well, uh, but we fucked up on a few things. We missed a few things out, which I'm going to tell you about uh, later. But the irony was, when I got to Sanima, I realized that everybody was making the same mistakes that we made. And I just thought, how are you surviving by making these mistakes? And I had nine months of banging my head against the brick wall, trying to get this message across. I wasn't really getting anywhere. So when Susan cut my division, I was thinking, oh, actually, this isn't a bad thing. I can just go back, you know, carry on somewhere else. But before, before she cut our division, she did something that I thought was really clever. She had an exit interview with every manager, and she said one question, like, what would you do if you were me? And I was ready for that question. And I had a little deck, because I'd actually done it for a startup that uh, I, I was working with. And I said, Susan, this is all the things we're doing wrong. You know, we're not data-driven, we're not customer-centric, our data's in a mess, we're not optimized, we're not A-B testing, blah, 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 blah. And at the end of that meeting, she looked at me and said, Matt, I love it. It's logical. It makes perfect sense. Uh, and not only do I love it, but I think the future of this whole company in all countries is dependent on implementing your ideas and these principles. Will you stay on and help me do this? And obviously I said yes, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, and this really is the story of what happened. And this was two and a half years ago. And she gave me a great role, um, reporting directly to her. And all the, I took over all the sorts. We have like central expert teams that basically set up an internal agency. She gave me a great budget and she gave me a mandate. She said, you can use my name whenever you want. Do whatever you need to do. Make Sanima a customer-centric, data-driven company. And I walked out of that meeting, and I, my first reaction was, yeah, you know, got a great role, I've got budget, you know, there's so much potential in this company, you know, I'm going to be a 6L presenter, I'm gonna, they're going to write books about what I do here. And then about five seconds later, reality hit, and I was like, oh, fuck, what am I, what? you know, it's so easy to say, you know, you need to do this, this, and this, but all of you working in this field will know the devil's always in the execution. And it's always so hard when you get back to your desk to actually make these things happen. And Sanawa, the problem was an absolute optimizer's nightmare. In everything you don't want, we have. You know, we had legacy systems and people, politics, bureaucracy, massive organization, hippos making the decisions. So what happened is that basically I went to war. And the last two and a half years, I have been at war. And this is pretty much how I felt every day going in on the train. Susan's sort of playing <laughs> Gandalf in the background. Uh, and I fought so many battles, and I've won a few. I lost a lot. But I'm winning the war, and I'll tell you why uh, at the end. And in the last two and a half years, I've had pretty much everything thrown at me. I've seen, it, I've seen everything, and plus, obviously, with my startup. Um, so when Pep asked me to do this presentation, I was, at first I was like, you know, why, why me? You know, I'm not one of these veterans and world experts like Els and other Brian, and you know, they've got all this experience. But I do have this kind of unique perspective. I've tried so many things with so many businesses in Santa Maria and, and in my startup that I sort of, you know, sat down and thought, okay, well, what is it that actually make, why is some optimization working in some places and not others? What is it that you need to make optimization a success? And it comes down to, you know, I've really distilled it down to seven things, and not just drivers of optimization success. I believe they're actually drivers of survival. Because in my mind, optimization is not just a technique and something that, you know, you do on your own. It's, it's a way of working. It's got to become a philosophy. And what I'm going to show you in my process, I think, you know, I'm trying to ingrain that in all of our businesses, that they've got to be following this new way of working, you know, we're undergoing a revolution in the way we have to do things now. Uh, and those companies that are not, are not going with that revolution and changing their ways are the ones that are, gonna, are not going to survive, which is why we're seeing so many big brands just being disrupted and destroyed and dying. So when I came out of this meeting, uh, the first thing I sat, I sat down and made a plan. The first thing I thought I need is a standardized, is a process. Um, because everyone's off doing their own thing and, and doing it badly. And the problem was, you know, for me, there's some really good frameworks out there, and these three are my favorites, which I'm sure you'll recognize. But, you know, how do they, f I want to use all of them, but how do they fit together? And there's lots of other things, like, you know, tag managers and, you know, motivational personas. You know, where do they fit in? 
And there wasn't really one process that did it all. So I basically created my own, and obviously it's an extension of, of Brian Eisenberg's pyramid, but this is my five-step process. Um, and the first thing, I'm just gonna quickly run through it. I write a blog, actually, it's called Grow by Three in the top there, .com. So I talk about this a lot more in more detail, because uh, I don't have time at the moment. But the five-step process, right at the bottom there, it starts with your goals. And Bagley said this yesterday, you've gotta know what you wanna get to and what you wanna achieve. Then the first step is product customer fit. This is the one that I fucked up on my startup. And what it means, and it should be simple, is about designing a product or service that customers actually need, that solves their problem. And this is done so badly, and this is what our businesses were doing so badly. And you know, they're established businesses, sure, but you know, they're designing new features and functions that customers don't want all the time. It's not just about products, it's also about features, and, and it changes. You know, your product customer fit changes over time. Ask, you know, like Nokia's and phones and things, everything changes. And in this step, you've got, you know, the first thing you do is you go out and have to understand what the customer needs and motivations are, right? Then you develop a value proposition, your value proposition canvas, to, you know, design something that actually solves that need. Then you move into lean design, which is about creating a prototype and MVPs that, create, you know, gives you something that you can actually solve that need in, in reality. And then you iterate it and test it. And this is where build, measure, learn, you know, lean startup comes in. And this process is done so badly. Data analytics then, you know, also getting your data analytics correct before you do anything else. You know, Ed talked to yesterday about customer data, getting that right, um, but also, uh, you know, your infrastructure and the asset underneath, but also your analytics and, you know, being able to record your KPIs and track your customer journeys and actually track your funnels. And then the other steps you probably know about, you know, functional usability and persuasive, that's in the Eisenberg Pyramid. What I then did was then, against each of these steps, I listed the elements, uh, the, all the little levers that I can play with. And then next to that, all the tasks and analysis that you can do in each of those steps. And I've been told this looks a bit overwhelming, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this. This is my, my giveaway to you, uh, to take away and look away later. But you can map actually those three frameworks onto this. So I now had a really nice process that actually encapsulated everything that I thought was important that I wanted to do. There's another one I have for marketing, by the way. Uh, again, I won't go through it, but it's on my blog. So why did I need a process? Why was that the first thing that I thought I needed? And there are six really good reasons. The first reason is, is completeness. Now, you may think that was overwhelming. I think you need to be, if you're a CRO, you need to be doing everything on that previous slide, everything on that list. And there's a lot to remember. Uh, and so you forget things, and this was happening all the time at Sanders. So having a, it's like a checklist, this process. So now I have a checklist, all the stuff that needs to be done. And the thing I've really learned about optimization since I've been in the game is that order matters. And these bottom two layers are really, you know, the difference from, from my pyramid to Brian Eisenberg's pyramid, adding, Brian Eisenberg's pyramid is adding on these two layers at the bottom, and they are your foundations. And you can't optimize without having these in place. You really can't, and if you're a CRO, if you're not involved in these two steps, you need to be, and you should be. And let me give you some examples. So we're working, one of my, our biggest publishers, uh, I said to them once, what need do you serve for your customers? And they didn't know. And they'd done this whole strategy by sitting in a room coming up with what they think and produce a digital strategy. It was crap. So we went off, my team went off and did a whole customer needs exercise. We found out exactly what the need was that we were meeting. We completely did the strategy and the old one got ripped off and this one got adopted. And the great thing was that we were having all these problems with the optimization program and arguing with the clients about, you know, they wanted to build this feature and this and do this and this. And suddenly, once we understood the need and everyone understood the need, everything fell into place. It was so much easier. The features you're gonna use, the functions, the copy you write, the way you market, you can't, you can't do that effectively if you don't understand the customer need. The data analytics, then I went on to data analytics and I said, what are your KPIs? They didn't, you know, they had some basic business ones, but nothing about, you know, the, the way their site worked or the customer experience. So we did the whole goal trees, we came up with KPIs for them, and it turned out we couldn't actually measure half of them. And they, that was bad for their business, obviously, decision, but it's also bad for our optimization because we couldn't actually track the impacts that we were having. So you can't do optimization without doing these steps. This is really my belief. The other reason is that, you know, these bottom three and a half steps, they are about fixing the basics first. And unless you're working in the booking.coms or the Instagrams of the world, I can guarantee that you're gonna have a lot of work to do in these bottom steps. And when I took over the data science team, for example, we had, we had 10 data scientists in Sanma, costing a fortune building all these complicated algorithms. But the data going into these algorithms was in a mess. It was useless and they weren't working because we hadn't done step, step two. So the biggest wins are also at the bottom. You know, th there's a reason this is a pyramid. It's not because it was my favorite sort of smart art. But these steps build up on each other and you know, the volume that you, you know, of, of wins is really there at the bottom and laying in those foundations. 
And I've seen it time and time again. And it happened at Sonoma time and time. People hire A-B testers and you just jump into the sexy stuff. The sexy stuff is personalization and psychology and this kind of stuff. But the rest of the stuff is in a mess and that stuff's not going to work. So the order matters. Next is efficiency and performance. So having a standardized process now, you know, people know what they're doing. They're doing the right things. They're doing, they're doing it completely. They're doing it in the right order. And the more they're doing it, they're getting better at it and getting it faster. Um, so we're getting better results. We don't lose that IP if people leave, because previously everyone was making up their own processes and stuff, and when they left, you get left with a mess. It's great for explaining yourself. So I've used this framework uh, to really train, basically to train our board and all the execs on what I'm doing. And it's a funny sort of paradox of our time. I, like, I'm in my early 40s, but everyone older than me doesn't really understand digital. You know, I had to retrain myself a lot, actually. And I can, when I present to the board, I could tell them anything. You know, I say bounce rate's up 10%, they'll all cheer. But actually, I tell them, I show them this framework, and I tell them the steps, and they're like, yeah, you know, we understand digital now. You know, we, it makes sense to them. And I, you know, it really is great for getting that support behind you. And I've always had great support at the executive levels, you know, probably because they don't know what they're doing, but I'm actually giving them something that makes sense to them. It's also great for explaining to my teams downwards, you know, this is what my expectations are, this is what you need to be doing. Great then for accountability and managing, you know, I have a huge portfolio to manage, but you know, having these checklists and this process in place means I can see what people are doing, where they're up to, how they're getting on. I love process, in case you haven't uh, worked that out. Uh, so the next thing you need uh, is you need budget, because you, you need budget to enable these processes. It's about getting the tools and resources you need. And often here, this is a complaint that people don't have budgets. I use this framework to tell people why I need a budget, to explain it. So on the right-hand side, these are all the resources I need for each of those analysis, the tools and the people. And on the left-hand side is the money I need. And I can tell you now, as a manager myself, uh, who has budget to give away, you know, if someone comes to me with a very clear process that sets out, Matt, this is what I want to do, these are the steps, straight away you've set yourself apart from 99% of other people uh, that don't have process. And you've also got, you know, it gives me an indication that you're going to execute well and you're going to give me value for my money. But it helps even more if I can understand the steps you're going to go through and I can see what the money's being spent on. And contrast that with someone that comes to you and says, you know, I want 500K for a CRO program. You've got to make it easy for people to give you money, and this is how you can do it. The next thing is organizational structure. Again, I, I could spend all day talking about this, and I think this is the hardest thing to get right in CRO. Um, and the reason is that the old way we used to do things, and you've all seen this, you know, it used to go from the strategy team to product to IT, and it'd be this big step-by-step -step process to launch and develop and grow a product. It'd take forever. And that process, silos worked. What happened is the digital revolution happened, and now we have this constant stream of you know, customer feedback, basically. You don't need to wait that long. And these four, first four silos have to be working together in this build, measure, learn process. You can't, it doesn't work in going step by step anymore. And in this new way of working, these silos, they don't fit. And this is the biggest challenge I'm having at Sanoma because no one wants to get rid of these silos. All the senior execs love the silos, this is what they were taught, but they don't work. And the core of this new way of doing things is what I call, is called the growth team. And if everyone's ever read Brian Balfour's blog, I'd highly recommend it, but this is where I got this from. But basically, a growth team has a product owner slash CRO with a, working with a front-end developer and a designer, doing very fast iterations, coming up with the research, coming up with the ideas, building the experiments, implementing the winners. This is how you come fast. And yesterday, there was a quote, it was a brilliant quote about the fast fish eat the slow fish. If you're not doing this, you're going to be a slow fish, and this is what you need to move to in the future. I'm having all sorts of problems at Sanoma because the developers obviously don't like this, that I'm taking away their development, they're losing control. Uh, I've now got a trial going on one of our bigger brands, actually, where we're doing this, and it's working really well. So fingers crossed for that. But you can add in a customer researcher, you can add in an analyst, and then you have a really great team that can run that pyramid process, that can run your optimization and deliver on for the customers. Next one is skills. Uh, this is sort of my cheesy optimization value formula, I call it. But and you can apply this at your personal level, you can apply it at a company level. But basically, the value you're going to add as an optimizer really comes down to these four things. Knowledge plus process is about what to do. And if you have knowledge, you're going to know what to do. But it doesn't actually matter if you don't have knowledge, because if you've got a great process, it will tell you what to do. And knowledge isn't always reliable these days. This is why I like process so much. Because what, like, take marketing, you know, what worked in marketing a year ago, you know, doesn't work. Even six months ago, it doesn't really necessarily work now. But if you've got good process, you're OK. Skills and attitude, they can't be zero. They're amplifiers. And even if you're the best process in the world, if, you've got, if you don't have the skills or the attitude to do it, you're not going to add value. And they're about the execution. 
So I've talked about knowledge. You just got to get your hands dirty. I've talked about process. Even if you don't like mine, you know, you can tweak it, adapt it, or get your own, but get one. If you want skills, and I'm not just blowing their trumpet because I, I'm at their conference, but I think the CNXL Institute is the best source of training you will find in this. And I've looked at lots of university courses. I've been to top universities. No one does it better than this. The, the people that run these courses are world experts. And the real beauty of it is, and you may, you may found that my process was overwhelming, and I'm saying to you, I think you need to do everything on that list. But you don't have to understand everything on that list now. And the great thing about the Institute is, you know, I call it just-in-time learning. Whenever I come to something that I don't know, or my team doesn't know, we just jump on there and we do the course, and bang, we move on. Fantastic resource for skills. But it's not just the optimizers. I've been training, and to tell you, I'm like their number one customer. I've put like 30 or 40 people in our company through the foundations course. You know, I've been, with, with mixed success, the CEO and the head of marketing and the head of IT, but, you know, these people have got to understand optimization as well. And I go back to my earlier point that it's a philosophy and a way of working. It's not just something, and I've met CEOs that, CROs that are just stranded on their own doing optimization. That's just never going to work. Everybody's got to be buying into this, and they've got to understand it. So the more people you can train in this, the better. Attitude. So at Santa Maria, I've really come across three types of people. There's the enthusiasts, and they just get it. Either they get it already, or they get it as soon as you tell them. Then you've got the proofers, and proofers, you have to prove it to them, but once you get results, and they often don't say it, but they'll just adopt what you're doing. And then there's the deniers, and it's no matter how much you explain it to them, how much results you get, they just don't want to know. You know, they're comfortable in their jobs, they don't want to learn new skills, and there's really nothing you can do with these people, and we have a lot of them, at, we had a lot of them at Sanima. And this really comes down to the attitude part of it. Um, and there's no way I've, I've, I've found you can't train people that have a bad attitude. You, it's just recruitment, redundancy, and resignations, and this is how you, you get people in. And we've, we've been doing a really good job of getting these people out at Sanima. The next thing is culture. <laughs> so culture is the environment in which you're operating in. Uh, and I, I was presenting at a conference two weeks ago, and I got really asked, I thought it was a really hard question, which is, what is culture and why is it important? And my answer to this was, it's, culture is like the combination of all the attitudes, opinions, and traditions that you have in your company. And the reason it's important, for two reasons that I, I can think of, maybe more, but firstly, as a human being, we're social creatures, and it's very hard to go against what everyone else is saying, and you feel the peer pressure. And for my first year at Sanoma, I really felt like a lone ranger, uh, you know, really going against the current, and it was hard. The second reason is that, as I said before, it's a multidisciplinary thing now. You need to rely on other people. You can't do it on your own. So having people that are, you know, have opinions against you is, makes your life difficult. So how do you get culture? You know, what do you need? You need a, a data-driven culture. You need this permission to fail, which means you can iterate and test. We really didn't have that at Sanma for a long time. And this focus on long-term customer value, and there was a great presentation by Brian on Amazon yesterday, I and mean, this is exactly what they do, and this is exactly the way you need, what should be there. But how do you get it? How do you get culture to change? It's, it's difficult. And these things I've told you already, like, you know, give people a process, give them training, get these deni replace these deniers. But then it comes down to results as well. And one of the very first things I did, actually, uh, when I joined, started this program, I couldn't, apart from the smaller brands, none of the big brands would do A-B testing. And I ran a pilot project, and in three months, it made 500,000 euros. Suddenly, everybody wanted A-B testing. We went from one CRO up to eight. Uh, and it really started getting the ball, ball rolling. There's nothing like case studies in a big company. You know, all the people that are against me and trying to find against me suddenly claim this as their own result and, you know, communicating about it. And that was great. But then the next problem was that everyone was incentivized based on revenue, not on being data-driven, not on customer centricity. And this caused a lot of problems. And actually now we've changed our whole incentive structure to align with this long-term customer value uh, perspective. And finally, CEO. I mean, I've worked for a number of CEOs now, and it always amazes me how the company values and culture come to reflect the CEO. And I gave the example of Mrs. Spock earlier because, you know, we're now a very logical and analytical company, whereas before it was a lot of politics and cronyism. And that really comes from Susan and the CEO. And now to do well in Sanima, you have to be data-driven. You have to be logical and make good decisions. And that brings me on to my last one, the CEO. It is so important. Uh, and so much depends on that. And all those six things I've said before are so much easier if you had a CEO. And I, had two, I was blessed with having two enthusiast CEOs to work with, and the other one was an absolute nightmare. And he hated me, absolutely hated me. And I've never been hated, really, in a, in a job before. Um, but he, everything, I, you know, all these new ideas, he took it as a personal affront that he didn't know how to run his business. Whereas the other two were like, yeah, this is great stuff, we need to do this, let's, you know, let's get on and do it. 
So back to my topic, which is big company conclusion. You know, what is it about big companies or legacy companies? And actually, the real reason, it's not about size, actually. It's about age. If you think about those things I've talked about, uh, in old companies, you know, you have old stuff with old processes, and you have the old organization structures around them, and the old budgets, and then you have people, you know, senior people in those positions that don't understand the new way to do things. That's, that is the problem. It's not so much size. I mean, size exacerbates it. Uh, you know, you become less flexible. You know, you can't change so much. You have politics. But, you know, looking at the booking.coms and the Amazon, size isn't necessarily the barrier. It's really about age. But Sanma is really proof that you can optimize anything. Um, and it has been a, an incredible turnaround in the company. I mean, partly, you know, some credit is my program, but the big part of it really comes from the CEO and her backing that and, and the cultural change. And I've listed here some of the biggest wins. Um, and again, there's too many to go through, but you can take this home and read. But the point I wanted to make on this slide is there's not one of these uh, has a P&L impact. These are all coming from those foundational layers. Like we have, we have cleaned up the data, we've got data strategies, we've got great analytics now, we've got growth teams that are meeting every week, and we're connecting with our customers, we're doing customer research like Els's, we're responding to feedback, we've got new incentive structures, the whole culture's changed, and the whole place is lifted. But not, no, P &L, no big A-B testing wins, I've had those, I didn't put them on this list, but you know, Susan asked me not to, but they're not even the biggest, for me, the biggest wins. All of this stuff we've done is just having an enormous impact on every part of the organization. And I'd say to you as CROs, if you're not doing this stuff, this is how you, you're really missing out on adding value to your companies. My final message is, you know, you're unlikely to ever get all of these conditions in one place. Again, unless you work for the Instagrams or the, or the booking.coms, but it doesn't mean you can't optimize. You can. You know, don't have to have AB, big A-B testing wins. It's really about the matter of impact, degree of impact you're gonna have. Uh, and the time frame you're operating on and what your expectations are. And in Sanima in two years, you know, we've changed the CEO, we've changed the culture, we've adopted new processes, we've got new budgets. The only thing I haven't done is the organizational structure, but things change over time, you can do it. And expectations, you know, I started off knowing that this was gonna take two or three years, I, and I said that with Susan, you know, you're not gonna see any big A-B testing wins for two years, and she's fine with that. And you know, you may have expectations yourself that, okay, I'm not gonna get so much impact, but I like the company and I like what I'm doing. So, it's not all about A-B testing wins. So my takeaways, you, know, you must get yourself a good process. To me, that is, that is the hygiene factor. Use mine, get yourself another one. And with that, you can really optimize anything. Big, old, even your worst nightmare, and Sanima is proof of that. Not getting A-B testing wins doesn't mean you're not optimizing. There is so much stuff that I have done that I think is in scope of optimization that doesn't require A-B testing, that doesn't need traffic. And in fact, if you're getting A-B testing wins, it's a sign of, to me, that's actually a bad sign. It's a sign of customer dissatisfaction and you're not doing those earlier steps properly. If you're designing and building your products in, in accordance with iterating with your customers, you won't be getting these big surprises and these big jumps later down the line. But you need to work for someone that understands that. Uh, and I've been very blessed in having that. Uh, and that is why we've been winning the war. Thank you.